Welcome back, everybody. Hope you've all been having a great week so far. A few things that I want to go over in the news. So one of them is President Trump has finally been acquitted. This is news that was expected, but this happened this week. We have the U.S. economy adding 225,000 jobs in January, wages rising just a hair. And then we have signs of FOMO. Tesla stock surged up to historic highs. And then we have a report that says that more than 22,000 investors bought Tesla stock for the first time on the millennial favored Silicon Valley trading app, Robinhood. So they bought it for the first time just over the past few days after this historic rise. To me, that that shows a little bit of FOMO, the fear of missing out. So I want to be talking about that a little bit. But the main thing I want to go over today is my portfolio and specifically what I look at when I view a company and it's one that I potentially want to add to my portfolio. I just want to give you a, a look into the type of research that I would do to try to determine whether it's one that belongs to my portfolio, whether it's one that I want to have some ownership of that company. So there's lots of ways to research a company. I'm going to be showing you the way that I do it. Now, like I said, first of all, I want to start off with my portfolio, the investing strategy that I'm doing, and more generally speaking, how I make the decision of if I want to buy a company or not. That's the big question. If we go and we look at the different stocks available here, you can scroll down and look through page after page of wonderful companies. These are all the companies in the S&P 500. Many of them pay dividends. There's a lot to look for. There's lots of great companies here. And the question that a lot of people have is looking at these companies, I recognize some of them. I like the products that some of them sell. I'm interested to know whether this is a good investment, whether I should buy shares of this company. And Everybody has different ways of looking at things, different ways of analyzing things. They have different things that they value in companies and different thoughts on them. What I would like to do in this video is share some of the things that I look at when I'm researching a company. Pretty much I have a bunch of different companies in my portfolio. Like I can go through any different sector. I can say in consumer, I have Disney and Costco and Home Depot and Target. And how did I come to the conclusion that I wanted to buy these companies? Why didn't I want to buy a bunch of different companies? In consumer, there are a lot of different companies ones that I don't own here. Why did I choose these ones over those other ones? I'm going to go to the whiteboard here. This is my nice little draw line whiteboard, and I'm going to put up two different terms. These are two different types of analysis. So we have fundamental analysis and we have technical analysis. Now, I think it's important to not only look at the type of research that I do, which is fundamental analysis, but to also look at the type of things that I don't look at, the type of things that I don't value. I don't value technical analysis. I don't like it. I don't care about it. I think it's kind of hokey. Uh, I don't think that there's much rhyme or reason in it. There's lots of books written about it, YouTube videos written about how to do technical analysis. Now, the reason that I don't like technical analysis is because what technical analysis focuses on is price movements, charts, patterns. It focuses on trying to predict human behavior. So you have things like this. This is a real technical analysis uh, chart that I found off a website explaining how to do it. You have things right here, the dip. TL derived from these two points. Then it goes back up and back down. We have break of TL fueled by accelerating lower. Then it goes down and back up. Former support becomes resistance. All this type of stuff where you're looking at charts and price movements and trying to predict whether the stock will go up or down is something that I'm so not interested in. It has nothing to do with the type of analysis that I look at when I'm trying to invest in a company. This isn't even something that I'm even interested in learning the basics about. So if I look at these two types of analysis, technical is one that I'm never going to look at. I don't really care about. I don't want to spend time and energy trying to learn technical analysis because fundamentally, I don't like the entire idea of technical analysis. I don't like focusing your money and your energy off of chart movements and pricing patterns and these type of things that I think are, are kind of nonsense. So technical analysis, the whole idea of it, I don't care about, I don't look at. Fundamental analysis is quite different. With fundamental analysis, you don't really care about any patterns with charts. You don't care about any of this type of stuff. What you look at is the actual company. You're looking at the company that you're owning. You're looking at the current price that it's trading at, and you're trying to decide whether the company is worth the price that you're paying. And that's the whole goal of fundamental analysis. They call it the intrinsic value of the company. That means that when you put all the factors together, is this company worth the current price it's trading at? So I'm way on the side of fundamental analysis. I couldn't care less about what other people are doing with the pricing patterns. I've said repeatedly on my portfolio that the capital gains is not that much of interest to me because a lot of buyers buy companies for stupid reasons. They're not buying them because the company deserves it or it's warranted. They're buying them because of the fear of missing out. They're buying it because of emotion. So whether a company goes up or down in value because of capital gains is something that I'm not really focused on. 
I look at the amount of dividends, the amount of cash flow that they're generating. So I'm on the side of fundamental analysis. If you want to learn about technical analysis, you can do that. There's lots of YouTube channels that teach about it. There's lots of books written about it. Just for the record, I think it's mostly nonsense. Now with fundamental, we can break this down into two categories. I went ahead and just put two terms on the board again. These look similar, but they're not the same word, even though they start off looking similar. One of them is qualitative and the other one is quantitative. Quantitative is only things that computers can look at. This is things like the balance sheet. Quantitative is like year over year gross income, the net income of the company, the yield of the company, the past 10 years of dividends being paid out and the dividend growth rate. All those type of things are wrapped up in the quantitative mathematical side of research. Then you have another aspect, which is the qualitative. This is things that you can't really look at with numbers. There's no formula you can just plug these things into. This is stuff like the moat of a company. What kind of competitors does it have? And does it have a good competitive advantage over its competition? Does the company have good leadership? Are they aligned with the goals of the current sentiment of the country and the direction it's going? For instance, I'll give you a couple examples. Qualitative research would be something like when you're looking at oil companies, if you just looked at the math, you might say, hey, these are really good companies. They're making lots of money. They're generating lots of revenue. But what has been happening with oil companies? They've been being hammered in the stock market because of sentiment. People don't like fossil fuel. People don't like working with coal. They don't like investing in it. They don't like being shareholders of it. Large institutions don't want to be associated with it because there's a negative stigma against fossil fuel. That is something that doesn't fall under a mathematical formula. That is a quality about those companies. It's a negative quality, and it's a reason that you might want to avoid investing in those type of things that doesn't show up in the math. So viewing both sides of this is very important. Now, if I had to pick what side was more important, I would say the qualitative aspect is more important than the quantitative. So things I look at with the products a company sells, the services it offers, the mode it has, the leadership it has, I think that that is more important and more telling than the math behind a company. So I'm gonna go and give you some examples to look at with both of these when you're looking at a potential company. So let's go ahead and look at a couple examples of how to do this different type of research. We have the quality research and we have the mathematical research, looking at qualities of a company, looking at the numbers behind a company. First of all, I want to start off with the mathematical part of it. Let's look at quantitative research. I want to pick a company. Let's go with Realty Income Corp. Okay, this is a, a known company. It's a real estate investment trust. For people that don't know, when you shop at Walgreens and Walmart, it's very unlikely that Walmart or Walgreens owns a building that they are in. Those are typically owned by real estate investment trusts, companies like Realty Income Corp. They own the building and then they lease it out to tenants like Walmart or Walgreens. Now, this is a company that I really like. It pays monthly dividends. There's lots of things that I like about it. Well, let's go ahead and look at the quantitative research behind it. A couple things that I'd look at here. First of all, I would find the company in something like Seeking Alpha. You can find this information anywhere, Market Watch, Yahoo Finance, any of them work, but Seeking Alpha lays it out, I think, in a pretty easy way. But you search the company, I can go over to dividends here. I can see that it's yielding at 3.51%. The reason that I look at dividends with this company is because the reason that people invest in REITs is for the dividend. So that's an important thing. Now I can go to the payout ratio, 85%. That is right where a REIT should be. They need to pay out about 90% of their income. So it's probably bouncing back and forth between that. I go to the dividend history here. And you can see that this company has a long term record of raising their dividend over time. So those are all good things to look at. We know that this company pays dividends and it has paid dividends for a very long time, but there's other things you can look at as well. Another page that I would look at is the key data of the company. This tab right here, this shows important information about the financials of the company. Now, people go to this page, you get blasted with a, a huge amount of data, and unless you're an accountant or you're in finance, you're not gonna be able to understand what half of this stuff is. Now. That's okay. There's only a couple things that you really need to look at here. One of them is the total revenue of the company. Pretty much, you're not looking at the expense, so you're not looking at the, the net income of the company. You're looking at how much money the company just took in. From every source, how much money the company took in from customers or clients. I look at Realty Income Corp. In 2014, they brought in $933 million, and then it went to a billion, $1.1 billion, $1.2 billion, $1.3 billion, $1.4 billion. What does that tell you about the company right there? When you see a revenue income like this, that goes from 900 million to 1 billion, to 1.1 billion, to 1.2 billion, 1.3, 1.4. What does that tell you about the management and the growth of that company? What it tells me as an investor is that they have an extremely stable, consistently growing business. There's no drastic increases one year and then declines the next. They have a stable growing business. That is something that's very important. 
Now, the reason that this is important is because companies can raise their dividends with a declining revenue stream. Their payout ratio would continue to go up. A good example of that was GameStop. They were raising their dividend and paying a really high dividend despite the fact that their revenues were falling. So you need to look at their total revenue, see if the amount of money that the company is taking in is increasing. Another thing that you can look at that's really important is the net income. This is the amount of money that the company is actually profiting after its expenses. So this is in millions as well, but the net income of Realty Income Corp follows as 270 million, 280 million, 315 million, 318, 362, 392. Again, year over year, this company has a higher and higher amount of income. This is all stuff that you can look at just with the charts. You don't need to do any analysis on the company. Just looking at these numbers without even knowing what the company does, you can assume that they have a pretty solid business model if they're raising their net income and their net revenue both at the same time. So these are two things that I look at. I look at the net income of the company. This is the amount that they're profiting. And then I look at their absolute revenue, the total revenue that they have year over year and what direction that's going. I think both of them are important because if you look at just the net income, the amount that they're profiting, they could be actually shrinking. This could be going down, but they're just squeezing more profits out of it by firing people, by closing shop in different areas and saving on expenses, but really they're taking in less money. They're just creating a higher profit. So I think looking at both of these, you want total revenues to be going up and you want net income to be going up. If one of them is going down while the other is going up, that paints a little bit different of a picture. So that's a couple basic things that you want to look at. In summary, when looking at a company that's a dividend paying company, you look at the starting yield, you see how that compares to similar companies. You look at the payout ratio. This is the amount that they're paying in comparison to the amount of income they have. So with REITs, this is supposed to be around 90%, which it is. You look at the dividend history. If they have a dividend history of constantly paying dividends and raising them over time, that's a, a pretty important thing to have if you're a dividend growth investor. And then you look at the key data here, on the financials of the company, you wanna make sure that they're growing their overall revenue and you wanna make sure that their net income is growing. If their net income is not growing, you need to find out why. You need to find out if they're just reinvesting that money back in and they're taking a loss or if they're really just struggling to make a profit. So these are all important things to look at with the mathematical side of a company. Now, another thing we can look at with the mathematical side of looking at a company is their actual website. So right here, I'm on realtyincomecorp.com. They have a website that's built for investors to look at their company and to show the different aspects of their company. Now, if I go to portfolio here and I wanna know what type of properties this company owns, it's a real estate company, I wanna look at the portfolio occupancy. Are they good at keeping their places leased? And I look right here and it has a chart of the occupancy since 1992. Since then, you look at it and they keep it almost full occupancy every single year. In fact, when we went through the recession, it only dropped to 96% occupancy. The recession barely hit these guys. They keep their properties rented. Part of that is because of the tenants they have, and the other part is because of the long-term leases. Now, other data we can look at, the total properties that they have. Look at the amount of properties that they've purchased over the years. In 1992, they owned 634 properties. Now, in quarter three of 2019, they owned 5,964. So these guys are good at purchasing new properties, renting them out, making a profit, and then they give that profit back to shareholders like me that use it to grow my portfolio. That is what this company does. That is a mathematical look at Realty Income Corp. We know that they're a company that keeps high occupancy with properties. They're a company that grows the amount of properties that they own every single year. They're a company that has a relatively low starting dividend yield compared to their competitors right now. They have a okay payout ratio right where it should be. They have an extremely stellar dividend history and their key financials show that they're growing their total revenue and they're growing their net income. Realty Income Corp, in my opinion, right now is a buy. If I was gonna put a rating on it, I'd say this company is a buy. I think that they're a solid company with very solid fundamentals behind them. So that's a company that I like owning in my portfolio. Now the mathematical side of evaluating a company I think is pretty easy. You just look at some key data of the company and you can get a, a pretty good picture on whether they're profitable, whether they're, they're growing their profits year over year, that type of thing. And you can draw conclusions from that. But if you're just going to look at the quantitative research, if you're just going to look at the math, you may as well invest in ETFs because robots can do that. They can look at the balance sheet of a company and build a fund that invests based off the balance sheet. 
That's something that there's lots of ETFs that do that. They just look at certain metrics and they either buy or sell the company solely based off of that. If your goal is to just look on the mathematical side, just buy ETFs, that's what they do, and you'll probably have pretty solid returns doing that. But there's a whole other side to looking at companies that I actually think is more important than the mathematical side. That is the qualitative research of a company. And I'll give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about. A company that I want to look at is Netflix. This is a company that everybody's heard of, everybody's familiar with, and this company is not being traded based off of its book value. There's no mathematical formula that would show the company's worth its current price. In fact, if we look at this, it's trading at a PE ratio of 95. At $366 a share for the amount of money that this company actually earns, that is very expensive compared to other companies far more expensive than most companies. So obviously there's some reason that people are valuing this company at a much higher multiple than other companies around it. People are looking at Netflix and they're looking at qualities of the company and determining that it's worth more than other companies that make similar amount of money. Now let's go ahead and look at some of the qualities of Netflix. Some of the things that they choose as their goals, their premise for their company, what they believe will put them in an advantageous position in the future. If I go over to their investors relation website here again, I can look at the long-term view. And here we have some basics about Netflix. And I know everybody knows about Netflix. I know that everybody's aware of this company, but if you actually look at what they believe, you might get some different insights in it. For instance, it says that people love movies and TV shows, but they don't love linear TV experience where channels present programs only at particular times on non-portable screens with complicated remote controls. Now streaming entertainment, which is on demand, personalized and available on any screen is replacing linear TV. So that's a huge basic premise of their company that linear television is being replaced by on-demand streaming. That is the premise of their company. If you do not believe or never believed in the premise of that company, you should not invest in Netflix because that's what they believe and that's what their company's geared to take advantage of. They say further on, changes of this magnitude are rare. Radio was the dominant home entertainment media for nearly 50 years until linear television took over in the 1950s and 60s. Linear video in the home was a huge advantage over radio and very large firms emerged to meet consumer desires over the past 60 years. The new era of streaming entertainment which began in the mid 2000s is likely to be very big and enduring also. So do you see how much you can learn just from reading two paragraphs of their long-term view here? They believe that this type of streaming is gonna be extremely transformative to the way that people consume entertainment. And you can already see that playing out. They believe that it will be the type of thing from when entertainment was mostly just on the radio to when linear television was first introduced in the home. They believe the same thing can happen with linear television now moving over to streaming and they're positioned as a company to be what they call, quote, one of the leading firms of streaming entertainment. That's their goal. They want to be one of the leading firms in the streaming world that they believe is the future of entertainment. So if you look at a company's goal and the, the statements they're making, and you don't believe what the premise or the conclusions that they're drawing, you shouldn't invest in the company. If they're saying that they think that streaming is going to replace linear television, and you think, I don't think that streaming is going to replace linear television. I think linear television will still be very big and prominent. It's not going to go anywhere. And I think that streaming is just going to be this kind of niche thing. Then you shouldn't invest in Netflix because they're not positioned for that premise there. They're positioned for the premise that linear television will continue to slowly die and streaming will continue to slowly gain subscribers and new people. Now, reading on, this page is just full of qualitative aspects of the companies, their goals, the way that they want to do things, the way that they don't want to do things. This is aspects of the company that are extremely important that can't be put into mathematical formulas. This is qualitative research. I think that this is the most important part of looking at a company. For instance, we look at content people love. They explain their goal of how they're going to curate content that satisfies the desires of people that have very different interests in the type of content they want to consume. Netflix wants to satisfy people with a wide range of content. They have Netflix's focus. This is the part that they are focused on, one specific goal. And part of this, it says that Netflix is a focused passion brand, not a do-everything brand. Starbucks, not 7-Eleven. Southwest, not United. HBO, not Dish. We don't offer pay-per-view or free ad-supported content. Those are fine business models that other firms do really well. We are about a flat fee, unlimited viewing, commercial free. Another section here, they highlight competition. Now, if I was to ask somebody, what is Netflix's competition? The go-to in your mind is likely, well, we got HBO, we got Hulu, we got YouTube TV, uh, we got Apple TV, Amazon Prime. We have all these other competing services, right? 
Netflix has a different idea of what their competition is. They call it the moment of truth, the thing that you do when you're seeking entertainment and the chance to relax. They say, we compete for a share of our members' time and spending for relaxation and stimulation against linear networks, pay-per-view content, DVD watching, and other internet networks, video gaming, web browsing, magazine reading, video piracy, and much more. Over the coming years, most of these forms of entertainment will improve. If you think about your own behavior, any evening or weekend in the last month when you did not watch Netflix, you'll understand how broad and vigorous our competition is. That right there, that sentence gives you an idea of what Netflix considers its competition. Pretty much anything during your free time, in your evenings, when you've had a chance to relax and you have a variety of different options of what you want to do, Netflix considers pretty much everything else competition. If you browse Facebook, Facebook is now competing with Netflix. If you're on Instagram and just browsing through and messaging people, you are competing with Netflix. All of those type of things take you away from Netflix. They consider it competition. They say we strive to win more of our members, quote, moment of truth. When those decisions are, say, at 7.15 p.m., when a member wants to relax, enjoy a shared experience with a friend or family, or is bored, the member could choose Netflix or a multitude of other options. Now see how much you can learn about a company and their goals and their competition and things that they're facing, the direction they're going with just a couple minutes of research. It doesn't take that long. This has really just been a couple things and you can gain a lot of information about the company. I could continue on with Netflix and learn more about this company, but I think you get the idea. The idea is to know what you own. That's what Peter Lynch says. He says, that if you're gonna pick out your own stocks, if you're not gonna invest in just an ETF and follow the market, if you have specific companies that you're interested in owning, at least do a basic level of research. There's lots of basic things that you can look at with the companies that you're invested in, and it only takes a couple minutes. When I looked through the different type of companies that I wanted to own, I looked through all those different qualitative aspects of, is this a company that I want in my portfolio? Now, my portfolio in specific, I follow a, a specific investing strategy, the dividend growth investing strategy, where I primarily invest in companies that have been paying dividends and have been raising dividends over time. And within that, I try to identify what I think are the best of class within those metrics. So that's my portfolio. If you're interested in looking at this portfolio, there's a link in the description of this video that says my main portfolio. If you click on that, it'll open it up and you can look at all the different holdings that I have. Okay, I wanna move on and talk about some news. We have the President Trump impeachment. This whole thing has come to an end. He was acquitted. There was a vote. Only one person voted against party lines. So it pretty much went down party lines. But Mitt Romney, one person voted against him. I first want to say that this follows kind of what I thought it would be, where investors, I don't think, ever really cared about this. Investors care about uncertainty. The acquittal here, this is something that was a pretty certain outcome. All the Republicans, except for one, voted in favor of acquitting him. And since the Republicans had a bigger majority, he's acquitted. That's exactly what happened there. Now, moving on from less divisive and more positive news, we have the jobs report. The jobs report was great. We have 225,000 new jobs being added. The unemployment rate actually went up a little bit, which doesn't you know, make sense right on the surface because you have more people getting jobs, but you also have the unemployment rate going up. That just means that people that weren't even looking for jobs, people just living off of social safety nets or with family members, now they're deciding to enter in the labor market. They're applying for jobs and looking for them. So the unemployment rate going up a little bit is actually a positive thing because we have more people that weren't working now looking for jobs. And on top of that, we have better than expected wage growth. It says that wages climbed 3.1% from a year earlier, a touch stronger than December's rise of 3%. These are all pretty strong numbers. It bodes well for the economy. And if the economy does well, then the stock market will likely will do really well. Now, the last bit of news that I'll mention is Tesla. The stock, I think we're seeing a lot of FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. This is a thing that a lot of new investors get into where one stock goes berserk and after it's already gone berserk and gone up tremendously, that's when people buy it, right? What you don't want to do is you don't want to be the person that buys it at the very top. You want to be the person that buys it down here. That's where you want to have bought it. Now, FOMO is a real thing. The fear of missing out is a real emotion that people have. They see something that's exciting that has a lot of people involved in it, and they want to be a part of it. You're afraid of missing out on future returns with this stock. I do not believe that FOMO is a good investing strategy because what it leads you to do is being a shareholder at the tail end of an investment, one that you're already buying after significant moves have happened. So we got a report here that says that 
more than 22,000 investors bought Tesla stock for the first time on Robinhood in the past three days. 22,000 investors on Robinhood bought Tesla stock when it was at this price. For the first time, they've never owned the stock. I bet a lot of them, it wasn't even on their radar. They didn't really even care about the company all that much. But now that it's had this crazy run and has gone up in price, now they're a shareholder of it. Now, what I don't wanna do is give the impression that I'm against Tesla. I think that Tesla is a really good company. It's probably the coolest car company that exists. The reason that you should buy this stock, if you're jumping into it now, is because you believe that Tesla will be the biggest car company in the world. You shouldn't buy it because it's exciting and you're afraid of missing out on the excitement. That's not a reason that will keep you invested when there's a high amount of volatility. If it drops down to $600 a share, $550, and you're just invested in it because, well, there's a lot of news articles about it and it seemed like fun to invest in, it might be harder for you to hold on to the company than if you do some research about it and if you really agree with its outlook. So I think that Tesla is a great company. I'm not telling people to sell out of it. I'm not telling people that it's a bad investment. But I also don't think the fear of missing out is a great reason to jump into a company. So make sure you know about the company, you know about their goals, and you're in it for the long run if you're going to buy stocks at this price. Okay, let's get to some emails here. Joseph Carlson Show at gmail.com. That is Joseph Carlson Show at gmail.com if you'd like to email in your question. KC says, hi, Joseph. Last fall, I bought into an energy fund, ticker symbol JMF, Nuveen Energy. It was recommended from a friend whose dad bought it and did well. I bought it for the dividend. I didn't know what I was doing. It was not a wise choice. After I bought it, it has gone down and went back up. In the last month, I've been doing some serious learning about the stock market. I better understand the mess I'm in. I didn't diversify and picked an industry, oil, that is not doing well. I'm down $22,000. Please help me. I have no idea what I should do from here on out. I don't know if I should sell now as Tesla is making the oil industry even more skittish or stay in and see what happens with the election and the coronavirus recovery. Please help. I'm scared for the future of the industry and my money. The dividends are good, but they just got slightly cut. Thank you, KC. Okay, KC. Well, first of all, I'm sorry for the situation you're in. That is not a fun situation in to be losing money. You know, you have to go through that. And I can tell just from your email, the first thing is that You've lost money and you have a little bit of what I think is the sunk cost fallacy. The sunk cost, you've lost money and you want to get it back. It's like when a gambler goes and they they go to the poker table and they play a hand and they're pretty confident with it, but they end up losing and they lose some money and they think, dang, I just need to earn back what I lost. I just want to get back to square one, just where I started with. I don't want to earn a ton of money. I just want to earn back my losses. That is the sunk cost fallacy. What happens there is you have a mentality, this is the way that we're wired, is that if you lose money, you almost feel like you're owed that money back. If you lose money at a slot machine, people feel that eventually they'll win because eventually, you know, if they have enough losses, they'll eventually win a lot of money back. The problem is, is they don't realize that mathematically the odds reset every single time. And that's the way that you should view it right now. You should view it like everything is completely reset. Erase all the history. Erase your previous investments. Don't look at how much money you've lost so far. Look at the future. What is the best decision you can make going forward? I can give you a couple ideas of things that I would do in your situation. First of all, I would not wait until the election or until any XYZ happens. I would start making changes to your portfolio. I would divest from your oil holdings right away. Another thing that I would do is I would use diversification. That is an extremely important thing to do to minimize the risk of concentrated risk. What you did was you chose the one sector, oil, out of all the different sectors, you chose the only one that's in the red. That's what happened. And you got unlucky there, that happens. But what you can do to make that never happen again is you can spread out the risk between all the different sectors. I, for instance, in my portfolio, you can see that I have real estate, I have bonds. So I have some in real estate, I have some in debt, I have some in healthcare and telecom and finance and consumer. And that way, if certain companies or industries get hit, it doesn't really matter because I have other ones that are doing well. I have Boeing that is having all sorts of trouble. Doesn't matter. I have other industries that are doing well. My oil holdings makes up a very small portion of my portfolio. But again, I'm diversified. That way I have other companies that are doing well, far exceeding the losses that I'm taking with the ones that I'm losing. If you invest, you're going to have losers and winners every single time. If you have an ETF, yeah, the whole ETF might be up. But within the ETF, there are lots of companies that you're losing with. 
with individual stocks, you just see the individual companies you're losing with. But if you own the S&P 500, there's lots of companies going up and down. On aggregate, usually things go up. So you need to diversify. That would be the first step that I would take. The second thing is with oil specifically, this is an industry that I don't really like all that much right now. There is an enormous amount of negative stigma to oil companies. The numbers might be good. That is the quantitative side of it. The qualitative side shows that there is a lot of stigma and it's something that I think is, is something people should be cautious of. So I have minimized my exposure to oil specifically because I consider a risk. I consider a lot of investors moving away from it. I don't think that young investors really want to get into it. I think that older investors with lots of money and institutions don't like to be associated with it. So oil is something that I would not keep the majority of my money in. Maybe it will go up in value. You know, you might sell out of it and put it in other things and it will go up in value. I wouldn't worry about that. I would absolutely diversify your portfolio. I would minimize your exposure to oil. You can still keep some of that. You can still have some exposure to it. I don't think it's a smart move to wait until it comes back up in price. You might be waiting and seeing it fall further and further and further. It can continue to fall. I wouldn't wait for any XYZ to happen before you build yourself a solid portfolio. You want a portfolio that you can happily put money into and not worry about what's gonna happen. You are so far away from that. This email shows that you're afraid of what your money's doing. You don't have it settled in a way that you like, so you need to go back to the drawing board and construct a portfolio that you are happy to put money in. Jerry says, hi Joseph, I hope all is well. I found your channel on YouTube and really enjoy listening to your videos while I work. I look forward to watching your journey as I'm beginning my own and investing for retirement. I'm curious about something as I may end up with the same eventuality once I grow my portfolio. I am wondering what your plan is to handle annual taxes when your dividend income grows into the thousands. I'm just curious if this will eventually become something that you will need to withdraw the tax expense amount out of your portfolio to cover them or if there's another idea of how to handle this. I love your content so far and I plan to follow your adventure as well as share your insightful content with friends and family. Keep it up, Jerry. Okay, Jerry. Well, first of all, I appreciate you sharing the channel with family and friends, and I appreciate everybody that does that, that shares the content with other people. Uh, your question, though, of what do you do when you get to the point where your dividend portfolio is so big that now you're actually having to consider the tax burden on it? Because dividends, that's real money. That's not just paper money. That is cash being paid to you by ownership of these companies. When you have enough ownership in these companies, the amount that you're going to be paid is substantial. And the government, of course, is going to want their their cut of it. Now, for most holdings, the long-term capital gains rate is 15%. For companies that you've held for the long term, you're going to be taxed at that rate. So it's 15%. Now, REITs are different and some bonds are different. You'll pay income taxes on them. So you just pay the same rate as if you worked a day job. So the tax burden is different for different holdings. Most of them will be at that 15% rate. If your portfolio was paying you $100,000 a year in dividends, you can expect to at least pay $15,000 a year in taxes. Now, at the point that I'm at right now, I don't really have to concern myself with the tax portion of it. The tax returns I have that I usually get at the end of the year where I had the government withhold money from my job that I work and get paid every two weeks. I have them withhold some of the money and then they give me that money back via tax returns. They take the taxes out of that that I owe in dividends. So I don't really have to worry about setting money aside. But if my portfolio grew enough, I would actually have to be concerned with that. I would just deal with it the same way that my parents do with the apartments. They keep an account that has money in it so that if there's any issues, if there's anything that goes wrong with the apartments, anything that breaks, they can repair it. And I would do the same thing with the taxes for the dividend account. I would take some of the money that I'm getting paid in cash from dividends, I'd put that in a separate account, and then at the end of the year, I'd just pay the taxes from it. If you're paying $15,000 a year in taxes on your dividends, that means you're earning like $100,000 a year. That's a good problem to have. You're, you're netting $85,000 a year in that scenario. So that's the scenario that I would like to be in. I would like to be in the category where I'm making $100,000 a year through dividends and I'm paying the fifteen dollars to $20,000 a year in taxes. But I realize it's going to take a long time to get to that point. But thank you for the question, Jerry. I think I'm going to leave it there. Subscribe to the channel if you guys want more content like this and I'll talk to you next time.